Awesome. Good work. Good work. Mm -hmm. It was 100% what I needed. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Phil Ponce. On this Wednesday, November 20th, coming up on the program, the use of locked isolation rooms in Illinois schools, the movement to help women access hygiene products, and surrealism and satire come together in an exhibit by a Japanese artist. But first, by this time next week, Chicago aldermen will have voted on the city's next budget. Mayor Lori Lightfoot is optimistic, even as progressive groups say she's breaking her campaign promises. Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky has more. Amanda. Phil, she's not just optimistic about her budget. The mayor appears to see her spending plan as a fait accompli. No more fiddling, no more changes. No, the, the budget is the budget is the budget. The mayor made her comments after today's brief city council meeting. No real budget business was conducted then. The budget she has put forward will close an $838 million budget hole without a major property tax increase. Instead, the budget relies on refunding bonds, charging nonprofits for garbage pickup, and what she has called a modest increase on cloud computing services. Also, heightened fees on Uber and Lyft rides that go in and out of downtown, and a higher tax on dining out. On the spending side, a minimum wage increase within the city's borders, Sunday library hours, money for homelessness and affordable housing. We made key investments <clears throat> in Chicago's residents and communities that are most in need. Um, we attempted to apply a smart, holistic approach to policy that looks beyond addressing problems when they happen, instead seeks to keep them from happening at all in the first place. Amanda, it sounds like the mayor's plan is going to sail through. Is that what is expected to happen? Well, Phil, it did make it through some procedural hurdles and committee votes these past couple of days, so it does seem poised to pass, but not if some progressive organizations have their way. Already, some aldermen say they are expecting to vote no because they say it does not spend enough on needy communities. And while the mayor highlights spending more on mental health, homelessness, and affordable housing, progressives say that those investments are piddly, mere drops in a rusty, damaged budget. They're publicly calling on aldermen to vote down the spending plan. The reality is there is money in this city. We live in the fifth richest city in the richest country in the history of the world. If there's $2 billion for Sterling Bay to build condos on the north side, there's money to reopen the city clinics and there's money to pay for housing the 86,000 Chicagoans who are currently homeless. Lightfoot dismissed those critiques as invalid. And it's invalid in part because it is untethered from the reality of the fiscal challenges that we have in our city. Um, it's easy to stand on the sideline and lob bombs. It's much more difficult to govern, and particularly govern in a way that brings fairness and reality and fiscal prudence um, to a process. She also brought politics into the equation, the mayor pointing out that the United Working Families is supported by labor groups. Look, uh, this is an organization that's closely aligned with the Chicago Teachers Union. Um, I would expect that they will have a continual drumbeat of complaints throughout my term, and it wouldn't surprise me later in the day if they support um, a challenger to me. So you'll hear from them. 
you've heard from them re uh, repeatedly um, in those, these last six, uh, six months, and you'll continue to hear from them. Um, the, what we can do is make sure that we continue to make sure that um, residents and voters actually get the facts um, that's not obscured by noise. To put some context there, the CTU, of course, had endorsed Lightfoot's rival in the mayor's race. And even though the CTU mayor in Chicago Public Schools did eventually reach a contract agreement, there's some clear bitterness and tension following last month's teacher strike. Now, as you may expect, United Working Families pushed back. That's petty. Um, this is not personal. This is about what Chicago, what the poor, working, black and brown folks of Chicago need and deserve. And this is about what the 2019 mandate was for. It was for a candidate who said she would reopen clinics. It was for a candidate who said she would tax the rich. It was for a candidate who said she would reform the police. It was for a candidate who said there would be a dedicated revenue stream for housing. It was for a candidate who said there would be an elected school board. That's what the people of Chicago voted for. Ty used that old metaphor of this is a marathon, not a sprint in terms of lobbying for what United Working Families desires here. Now, that venture also, of course, is going to likely prove true when it comes to the politics at play. Now, as for that sprint of a new city budget, the vote is set for Tuesday. Amanda, thank you. And up next, students in isolation rooms at Illinois schools. A new investigation has details. <laughs> This afternoon, the Illinois State Board of Education announced an emergency action to stop the use of like locked isolation rooms in Illinois schools. It comes one day after a Chicago Tribune ProPublica investigation revealed that tens of thousands of cases of schools putting students into locked seclusion, often without any safety reason for doing so. In a press release, the state's education superintendent said, quote, the practices of timeout and physical restraint have been misused and overused to a shocking extent, we will take immediate steps to ensure the traumatic treatment described in the investigation never happens to another Illinois student. Joining us to talk about the investigation into seclusion and isolation rooms in Illinois schools are Jody Cohen of ProPublica Illinois and Jennifer Smith Richards of the Chicago Tribune. And uh, I have to say as, uh, as a journalist to another, congratulations on the fact that the work that you've done has resulted in such immediate uh, response by the government. But uh, we'll get to that a little more um, into that in, the, in a second. But first of all, um, Jody, describe what these isolation rooms are exactly. Great question. So these are rooms, they're called different things by different schools. They can be called the quiet room, the calming room, the resolution room. They are off, usually off a hallway in the school. They're tiny. Um, they have doors with magnetic locks that staff members have to hold to keep a child inside. That's for safety reasons. And we're looking at some photos here. Sometimes they have padding, but not always. And that's what they are. Sometimes they're converted closets. Um, Jennifer, who is put into these isolation rooms? Here we see scratch marks on, uh, on the inside of some of them. Right, so a lot of these rooms are used um, to control the behavior or force compliance or punish children with disabilities. And we saw you know, frequent use of these types of rooms in schools that particularly serve kids who have emotional or behavioral disorders. And uh, what kinds of things, Jody, did, uh, did you hear from students who had been placed in these locked isolation rooms? So what was really interesting is we were able to get incident reports from when students were placed in the isolation rooms and often the staff members would um, document moment by moment what was happening, even the dialogue of what the student was saying while inside the room. So we were actually able to hear the kids' voices in a sense. Um, we of course also spoke to children you know, ourselves, but through the records we could see children crying out, crying out for help, please, please help me, I'm scared, um, you know, you're torturing me. So we were really able to share with readers um, 
you know, what was happening with children. And Jennifer, what did you find out about the scope of the problem? How widespread is this practice used? Well, probably much, much more widespread than people anticipated it would be. Um, we, we were able to look within about 100 school districts and find instances of seclusion. We ended up documenting about 20,000 instances over one school year plus a little portion of last school year. Um, and, you know, that is a, a rather high volume. Uh, we also were able to tell in about 12,000 of those cases uh, the reason that was stated for the seclusion and found that in about a third of those, there was no safety reason documented first. And that's the only legal reason in Illinois to put a child in seclusion, is so, safety. So in other words, right now, uh, one can put a child in isolation in a locked room like we saw with the padded uh, walls and so forth, if it's to protect his or her safety or the safety of others. I mean, it has to, it's a specific reason, but uh, so what other reasons were they being put into the, these rooms? So current Illinois law is 20 years old and it, is, it specifies a student can be put in what's called isolated timeout if the student is a danger to themselves, another staff member, another student. So like Jennifer was saying, what we were able to do by going through all the records and document 20,000 cases is look at the reasons through these incident reports why the school was putting the student in isolated timeout, whether there was a physical safety concern, whether the student was being disruptive, which is not um, what the law says, whether they were not following directions, whether they were being defiant, whether they were you know, kicking their desk or throwing a pencil or, you know, we could see all of those reasons, spilling their milk, throwing a Lego. So Jennifer, it sounds like uh, in many of these cases, students were locked up simply for uh, misbehaving. For it, it amounted to a punishment, not a safety preventive. That's right. I mean, what you're seeing is, is sort of typical kid behavior. Uh, like Jody mentioned, things like kicking at a, the leg of a desk, um, refusing to do work, saying, you know, math is too hard and ripping up a worksheet. Those types of things um, did actually lead to children being put in often locked isolation for long periods of time. And Jody, to what extent were parents aware of what was going on? What did you find? So Illinois law specifies that parents need to be notified in writing within 24 hours. We found it was all over the place. Um, they, some schools in rural areas would mail a letter that would get there a week afterward. Sometimes they used generic forms. It was, you know, isolated timeout check mark um, or physical restraint check mark. So they would be documenting all, everything that happened and there would be a whole narrative and you could see why, what was happening at the school, but the parents weren't receiving all that information. They were just seeing, okay, on this day, my child was put in an isolated timeout. Which could, uh, the parent might easily think uh, that their child was told, go sit in the corner until you calm down. Right. It didn't uh, necessarily convey the fact that their child was being, was being locked up. Uh, this has been an issue as far back as 30 years ago, and you talked to a mother uh, who spearheaded an effort to change things uh, that, uh, all that while ago. Uh, what was her reaction to uh, what you discovered today? I, I actually did talk to her today. Um, you know, she was quite exasperated to hear that this was still a problem. I mean, her child is 45 now, and he was 16 when he was first placed at a plywood box in his, uh, in his special education classroom. Uh, when I spoke with her today, her response was, oh, wow. <laughs> you know, she could not believe that um, this many years later, Finally, there was some sort of action that she felt was satisfying. And for the record, uh, the Chicago Public Schools do not use isolations. These are districts in uh, other part of the state, but pretty much throughout the state, it's, uh, it's, it's a practice? It's certainly geographically spread. I mean, we, we've been in, in East Moline, we've been down to Centralia. Um, it, it, is, it is truly throughout the state, uh, throughout Cook County, in, in the suburbs, uh, Lake County, yes, everywhere. But as you point out, Chicago Public Schools has had a policy against using isolated timeout for about 11 years. I see. Uh, they do send students to schools that do use isolated timeout. Oh, I see. So. I see uh, students with special needs and, yes. and that sort of thing. So they go to special needs schools, schools for students with special needs, um, where, when Chicago Public Schools decides they can't be educated at their public neighborhood public school. I see. Well, as we mentioned, the Illinois State Board of Education did announced an emergency action today to halt this practice. Uh, uh, from, from what you can tell, what are they 
what are they actually calling for? Yeah, it's actually, it sounds, it sounds like a, a bold and swift plan. Um, they, are, they are calling for um, a stop right now to the use of a locked, isolated seclusion space. Um, so adults would have to be in the room with a child and helping them de-escalate if they're having, if they're in crisis, if they're truly having um, a safety emergency. Those children wouldn't be locked in there alone anymore. Um, and that's, that's happening right now. So do you, do you think the problem is fixed, Jody? Well, it's so soon to say, but they also are collecting data from schools from this school year and the past two school years on the use of isolated timeout. One thing while there was the state law, there was no monitoring of the practice. So there will now be some monitoring. They're going to have to report all their data to the state. Um, they, the, gov the deputy governor filed a complaint today on behalf of the students named in the investigation to investigate what happened um, at those schools. So. Jody and Jennifer, please keep us posted on uh, what's going on with this topic. And then uh, congratulations on your work. Thank you. Thank you. And there's more Chicago tonight ahead, so please stay with us. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. A major hospital prepares for a nurse's strike ahead of a big holiday. Brandis Friedman has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Brandis. And Phil, patients who need level one trauma care on the south side will have to go elsewhere for the next week and a half. The University of Chicago Medicine says it has closed its pediatric and adult trauma centers ahead of a one day strike called by the union representing more than 2000 nurses. That strike next Tuesday will be the second in two months as the two sides work to negotiate a new contract. The hospital says it's required to offer replacement nurses five days of work. Thus, the striking nurses won't return until Sunday, December 1st after the Thanksgiving holiday. A former vice chancellor for City Colleges of Chicago is under federal indictment tonight, along with seven other people, for allegedly defrauding the colleges of nearly $350,000. Federal prosecutors say 45-year-old Sherrod Gordon of Oak Park and the other defendants formed vendor companies to apply for and receive City Colleges contracts for work that sometimes was never done. Gordon faces 16 counts of wire fraud. City College's Chancellor Juan Salgado says he's offended that employees would squander the college's limited resources for personal gain. He adds the schools are implementing safeguards to ensure something like this doesn't happen again. And it's official. The Chicago Teachers Union and the Board of Education have a ratified contract. Board members today voted unanimously to approve the collective bargaining agreement with both CTU and SEIU, which represents thousands of support staff. They also amended the current budget to reflect the new contracts and the new calendar, which includes making up five of the 11 days students missed during the strike. And former Empire actor Jussie Smollett says he shouldn't have to reimburse the city of Chicago for the cost of investigating his case last winter because he already forfeited his $10,000 bail. He's also countersuing the city, claiming he was maliciously prosecuted after the Chicago Police Department alleged his racist and homophobic attack was all a hoax. The actor's attorney filed federal court documents today in response to the city's lawsuit seeking $130,000 to cover the overtime costs spent investigating the alleged attack. As for the weather, mostly cloudy tonight with a low around 43. Then rain starts early morning tomorrow and ex is expected to last throughout the day with a high near 55. Now, Phil, back to you. Thank you, Brandis. Still to come on Chicago tonight, a state representative resigned after a bribery charge, but is his replacement tainted also? That's ahead in Spotlight Politics. The movement to end period poverty, the lack of access for some women to feminine hygiene products. A new book presents a sweeping history of Latin America over the past millennium. Uncompromising paintings from Japan look at the dilemma of contemporary life. And Jeffrey Bear shows off a unique Chicago-made typewriter in this week's Ask Jeffrey. But first, some of today's top business headlines. Here's Crane Chicago business editor Ann Dwyer. Phil, Tribune Publishing stock soared as much as 15% today after Alden Global, a hedge fund known for making deep cuts to newsrooms, bought out Tribune's largest stockholder. Alden purchased more than 9 million shares from Michael Farrow for about $118 million. Bloomberg reports Alden is also negotiating with Tribune to put two of its representatives on the board. 
Meanwhile, the development team planning what would be the city's second tallest building has unveiled revisions at the street level. Those changes, however, would leave the design of the sleek skyscraper right next to the old Tribune Tower largely unchanged. The design changes mostly have to do with traffic management and creating parking and turnaround space. The tweaks come in response to neighborhood concerns that the super tall tower would snarl traffic in Streeterville and along the Magnificent Mile. If built, the tower would be more than 1,400 feet tall, edging out the Trump International Hotel and Tower to become Chicago's second tallest building. And finally, one of the state's biggest marijuana companies will be able to sell recreational marijuana from its existing medical dispensaries beginning January 1st. Illinois regulators approved five Verilife facilities operated by Pharmacan, as well as an outlet near Bucktown and another in Mount Prospect. So far, the state has approved 14 of the 55 medical marijuana dispensaries statewide to begin selling marijuana to recreational customers. For Crane Chicago Business and ChicagoBusiness.com, I'm Ann Dwyer. Back to you, Phil. Thank you, Ann. Empire actor Jussie Smollett is back in the headlines with his lawsuit this week, just as the state's attorney whose office cleared him of charges announces that she is running for re-election. Meanwhile, there's turnover in the state legislature. What's behind the Senate president's sudden retirement? And will a new legislator chosen under circumstances clouded by corruption be turned away? Here for more insight on this week's political stories are our spotlight political team of Amanda Vinicky and Carol Moraine. Amanda and Carol, always good to see you. First of all, uh, in this new re-election video, Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox says that she didn't handle the Jesse Smollett situation very well. Is that enough to placate uh, angry voters? It might help. Um, it's been a long time coming. She resisted it in the beginning, has gradually moved towards it, is facing, I think, some real opposition in this race. Um, and so I think voters do pay attention when somebody says, I screwed up, I didn't handle it well, I've done other things well, don't judge me on just this one thing. That's sort of what you're supposed to do, right? If you're a politician who makes a mistake, you apologize, hope to move on. The question is, is this enough? One would imagine that she probably is sorry, given that this got oh, not only, oh gone. yeah, I mean, global pushback, and that it continues to be, as you put it in the headlines. That said, she hasn't gone past the contrition. She hasn't said what she handled wrong, how she handled it, or could have handled it better. So we'll wait to see. And, and Dan yeah. Webb, the special prosecutor mm -hmm. who is assigned now, I mean, the, the possibilities of other shoes dropping it, it, are, this isn't are, going away this isn't going away jesse smollett is suing um this whole big combustible mess could become more combustible. And what about her potential opponents? Any uh, particularly strong ones that uh, are on the horizon? So there are several that appear to be running in the Democratic primary, and we're going to start to see that, Phil. Monday petitions, that, that's going to be, a, we'll begin to see who actually makes it as a candidate. But right now you have former prosecutor Donna Moore. You also have a retired judge, Pat O'Brien. And then the guy who's got big money, another former prosecutor, Bill Conway, whose dad is a billionaire and therefore soaking some of those billions in into his son's race. And that campaign is saying, yeah, the, the Smollett situation should be part of this. It shows how the office is operating. Importantly, he's up on TV. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's already mm. launched his ads in a, in a pretty big, pretty uh, pervasive media campaign. So he isn't waiting around for a starting gun on this. Let's talk about uh, the Illinois Senate President John Cullerton, who surprised people by announcing that he's stepping down sometime in January. He says he wants to spend more time with his family. Do you buy it? Uh, I think that may be a component of it. I would not rule out, though uh, he says it really isn't the case, that the surround sound of, of global, use Amanda's word, federal probes um, are really partially a driver. There are three people in his Senate. Senator Cullerton, who, uh, no, uh, a distant relation, who is indicted, Martin Sandoval, who's been raided, and Senator Terry Link, who allegedly wore a wire on, uh, on, on uh, a former state, a former rep, state we'll get into that in a we'll bit. We'll get into that in a second. <laughs> um, 
there's a lot happening. And John Cullerton is a lobbyist for the city. In this federal investigation, Phil, it touches the city council, the house, the senate, the county board, suburban government, Cinespace, ComEd, Exelon, gambling interests, uh, red light cameras, mm. and a host of lobbyists. Tentacles going in a lot of places, and he's still going to continue to practice law. Uh, Senate Democrats are scrambling to replace him. Uh, there's a front runner, I understand. A front runner, but there isn't going to be a vote until January. So we did hear that some of the other main names that were thought to be those who could really carry this race are going to instead be backing State Senator Kim Lightford. That said, it's not as if she has a lock on this. Um, Don Harmon is a state senator from Oak Park who has clearly wanted to have this position and hold this position from some time, and he has his own constituency. And then you have some of these other senators who may be and come through, they're not getting a ton of attention now, but they may not have all the votes, but they could become compromise candidates. And so we'll be talking about this, but Senate Democrats are going to be making that decision and those votes behind closed doors. And let's talk about something you, uh, you alluded to and that is there's already one new member of the legislature, the replacement for Representative Luis Arroyo, who, who as we know, resigned as he faces a bribery charge. Uh, there's a dust-up over the person chosen to replace him. Uh, what's, what's going on? What's going on here is that when you have a vacancy in the General Assembly like this, it is up to local leaders known as committeemen. They're partisan uh, electeds who get to choose the replacement. Arroyo, at the same time as he was a state representative, he resigned from that, but he is still a committeeman, and in fact, the committeeman with the most weighted votes. And he has not, as I said, stepped down from that position. He did not actually choose to pick his replacement, and that is, her name is Eva Dina Delgado. She is an executive for People's Gas. But he did give his votes to Alderman Ariel Raboyeris for it to vote in as proxy. And so that is how Delgado got this position in, in a heavy contest. And the question is, will the House actually see her? Well, and Speaker Madigan has been um, more proactive than it was argued President Cullerton was in saying we're, gonna, we're in a new era and we're cleaning things up and he has vowed that this is, is an improper use of power by someone who's in big trouble and so there could be um, there could be a fight in the legislature over let's, this. Uh, let's talk about the mayor for a second. Uh, the legislature is done for the year and the mayor does not seem to have had very much success. Uh, why not? Well, there could be a lot of reasons attributed uh, to, that contribute to that, and that could be that some say she started too late. I, in fact, spoke with one older woman today, um, Jeanette Taylor, who said that she had been saying, let's go down as a city council. I want to be part of this. Take me to the Capitol, and I can try to get some votes on board. Uh, you do see Chicago Democrats who are members of the legislature starting to form what uh, their own caucus, trying to become an entity onto themselves that they're hoping will bring traction more to the city's but issues. The question is, wh where's the governor on this? She's she's a new mayor, and and I think there's always going to be a little bit of chastening of you're not just going to walk in here, even if we're loyal to you and get everything you want. And Governor Pritzker has a huge agenda of his own, mm. including a progressive tax. He wants to consolidate pensions. He's got some stuff to do, and he's going to get his stuff done one might argue first. Amanda, Carol, thank you both. Appreciate it as always. Sure thing. And we're back with more right after this. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight podcast and subscribe. Have you ever heard the term period poverty? Nearly 25 million American women living below the poverty line are faced with a terrible choice every month between buying hygiene products versus other necessities. Carol Maureen joins us with a story produced by students at DePaul University's Center for Journalism, Integrity and Excellence that looks at a problem involving health, 
and self-esteem. Carol. Phil, a recent study shows that one in five girls in the U.S., including thousands of CPS students, have missed class because they did not have access to a tampon or a sanitary pad. Talking about menstruation is uncomfortable for some, still carries a stigma for others. But there's a growing movement around what is called period poverty, and some people, like Ida Melby, are tackling it one tampon at a time. There's a sense of dignity that's lost. And when, when girls can't go to school, or when women can't go to a job interview, or they have to miss work because they don't have the product that they need, um, the cycle of poverty continues. Ida Melby is a woman on a mission. Uh, we are going to make some deliveries. Her SUV is packed with boxes of tampons and pads and other feminine hygiene products for women who, because they can't afford them, once a month must improvise. So you might be using some rolled up toilet paper or a donated sock or a newspaper that you found in the trash. At her first stop on Chicago's west side, Melby unloads bags of feminine hygiene products to a location in North Lawndale. So far this year, her group, the Period Collective, has supplied over 170,000 products to 32 social service agencies. It's, it's a huge issue, and we're, we're trying to make a dent in it. Back in the car. We are headed to Chicago Lights. Melby says she first became aware of this need three and a half years ago. Yeah, it's, it's fuel for us to interact uh, directly with the women. Women like Yvonne Harness and Faustina Beninato. In Faustina's case, she is, at the moment, homeless, and daily is in search of warm, safe places. During the day, I go to different malls like Bloomingdale's, Water Tower. At night, she rides the L and works. Which is it today? If I'm very short on money, what should it be? Food, lunch, or, have the, or get the pants? Hiding, says Yvonne Harness, becomes routine. Yes, you are very hiding, and you don't, you don't want to go out. I would say that. You don't want to go out. What we know, based on a variety of surveys and studies, is that women in the United States spend $2 billion a year on period products. We know that in a majority of states, those women pay the highest sales tax for those products. And what we further know is that one in five school-age girls miss class because they can't afford them. In October, in Chicago's Federal Plaza, women and some men gathered to help shine a light on the access or lack thereof of period products. This rally, one of 55 held across the country, was organized by Mary Catherine Hannafee LaPlante, a junior at Mount Prospect High School. We go to a fairly wealthy, affluent public high school, and so you would think that we would have these products readily available, but I can't count the amount of times so I've gone to the bathroom and they just aren't there. Since 2018, Illinois requires that feminine hygiene products be available for free in bathrooms in public schools. When kids are in school, um, they're worried about being bullied if it happens. Um, and so unfortunately, a lot of kids actually miss school when they're on their periods because if, if you worry about bleeding through your clothes, you can't really focus on what's going on at school. For decades, feminine hygiene products were taxed at the same rate as computers, boats, and iPhones. Nearly three years ago, Illinois removed that sales tax. State Senator Melinda Bush sponsored the legislation. Anyone that's had a period knows it's not a luxury, and certainly to see it taxed at that upper rate seemed ridiculous. Though the state loses an estimated 10 to 15 million dollars in revenue, Bush argues the cost is worth it. Even the Department of Revenue was pretty quickly supportive. The economic impact, it was far overridden, you know, by, by the need to, to do this. The vote was unanimous, even though Bush said some of her male colleagues were uncomfortable at first. What they said back is, you know, I, yeah, you know, I have daughters, I have a wife, 
never really realized that. I didn't know we were paying those kinds of taxes. At Fourth Presbyterian Church in downtown Chicago, both Yvonne Harness and Faustina Beninato receive free hygiene products and hope. If you feel clean, you feel confident and dignified. Exactly. And being able to just go ahead and get fresh and clean and then dress and then you can go and feel confident and be the woman that you want to be and, you know, just, I, it's, it's hard to say. It's, it's hard when you don't have it. Our organization are hoping that one day we will not be needed, uh, that these products are available in every bathroom. And Eda Melby hopes one day hers will be mission accomplished, period. Melby's group is one of several organizations working to help women who can't afford hygiene products. Currently, 33 states tax them, but according to the New York Times, 22 states are currently attempting to repeal the taxes on them, as Illinois has. Carol, what is the argument against the repeal of these taxes, if there is one? There is one, and in fact, it's led by the Tax Foundation in Washington. It's a conservative policy organization that says when you exempt something from being taxed, something else is going to have to fill in the blank, the revenue blank. And so they feel that it's a kind of a shell game that doesn't help taxpayers. And how did Senator Bush go about getting uh, unanimous approval in both houses here in Illinois? She worked it hard, but one of the things she did with a little bit of humor on the day of the vote was she got some of those little price stickers, they're pink, and she put one on the lapel of every man and woman and said, today, we all have our period. Carol, thank you very much. And up next, a look at the history of Latin America as told by an award-winning author, so stay with us. Our next guest is a Peruvian-American journalist who has just written A Sweeping History of Latin America. Her new book highlights the continent's persistent economic inequality, racism, and violence, and three obsessions that she says, quote, have held Latin Americans fast for the past millennium. The book is called Silver, Sword, and Stone, Three Crucibles in the Latin American Story. And Marie Arana joins us now. She's an award-winning author of both fiction and nonfiction. She is also the former editor-in-chief of the Washington Post's Book World. And Marie Arana, welcome to Chicago tonight. Welcome to Chicago. Thank uh, you so much, Phil. First of all, uh, what are those three crucibles of silver, sword, and stone? What are you referring to? Well, you know, there's a lot of fun part to being a, a, a Latin heritage. I mean, we have music, we have culture, we have literature, we have all those wonderful things. But I have focused in this book on the three things that really moved populations and have um, sort of prevailed on the people of Latin America to change their lives to the extent that they will have exoduses, move around, all that sort of thing. So um, I dwell on the three major things that I think have done that, and those are the extractive nature of the region, of the society. We've always pulled things out. We've always given things away. Thus the silver. Thus, thus the silver. But it refers to other natural resources. Right, of course. It refers to gold and everything. The silver is just a metaphor. But um, a, a sword is the violence, that, which has, we were created in violence. We were created with a, a, a very violent, um, conflict of the conquest. Before that, the tribes were violent unto themselves because they were conquering each other. Um, and, and we have gone on to be one of the most violent um, regions on earth. The 10 most uh, violent cities in the world are all in Latin America. And this is heartbreaking. As to the stone portion of it. And as to the stone portion of it, it's, the, it's religion and faith and how that informs us and how that has always in some way been allied to power in Latin America. And you focus on three people, Leonor, Carlos, and uh, Xavier, as emblematic of the stories that you want to tell. Uh, can you just give us a one sentence on uh, who each of those people is, beginning with, uh, with Leonor? With Leonor. Leonor Gonzalez is a miner. She's a widow. She works in a, a mine, a, an illegal mine, at the very tippy top of uh, the Andes, under a glacier. It's the highest human habitation on Earth. It's at eight, 18,000 feet. And she scrabbles up the mountain to, to look for gold flecks in, uh, that spill out of the mine. 
Uh, Carlos is a Cuban who was um, sent as a very young man, a sort of ne'er-do-well, sent to the wars of Angola that uh, Castro fed tens of thousands of, of young Cuban men to the wars of Angola and was brutalized in the war and came back and uh, was uh, sort of dysfunctional in, in the Cuban community, ended up in jail, and then was released in the Mariel boat lift to uh, the United States in 1980 and went on to a life of crime in this country. Uh, and then, of course, there is my priest, Javier Albo, who is Bolivian, who came to this country, to Bolivia from uh, Spain. And he thought he would, as a 17-year-old boy, Jesuit novice, he thought he would be, he would be evangelizing the uh, people of Bolivia. And in, instead, he ended up being evangelized himself, very, very devoted to the indigenous and to the indigenous religions and the whole syncretic business of blending Catholicism with indigenous religion. Uh, one of the things you point out is that the history of South America, of Latin America, is different from the history of North America. And yet both were colonized, both were exploited. There was violence in North America. There was genocide in North America of native populations. How are they different? Different, though. They're very, very different, Phil. And the, 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 the reason I say this is because the, the, the actual, the, the, in, the indigenous who lived in the Latin American region and the indigenous who lived in the North, northern region were, number one, very, very different. Uh, we, they had large empires in Latin America, whereas we, there were no large empires as such. You, put, um, you uh, make the argument that uh, North American indigenous people were more nomadic, whereas, uh, generally speaking, uh, whereas in uh, Latin America that was not the case. And and, and in in the North American case, it was a it was an effort to wipe them out or push them back. In the Latin American context, it was, they ended up wiping a lot of them out, but they married them. They conjugated with them. They had children with them. So we have a mestizo race in Latin America that it mestizo doesn't exist. Mestizo meaning, meaning mixed. Meaning mixed, mixed race, which we have in Latin America and we don't have in North America to that extent. Um, One of the things that, uh, getting back to something you said about the, uh, the your observation of much of Latin America having a, a streak of violence. Uh, that has been the subject of criticism. People who have read your, uh, who've read the book, saying that violence exists in all segments of the, uh, all portions of the world. That there are many segments of the world where uh, populations seem to be attracted to strong-armed dictators, whether it's Korea, whether it's Russia, and so forth. Uh, state your case for that. Absolutely. In, in the United States, for instance, we are a very violent culture, we might say. Uh, the, the, the violence here in the United States is random. In Latin America, it is an organized violence. It is generally, uh, as you say, military dictatorships repressing the people and then the people rebelling. Uh, we've had drug wars. We've had um, any number of terrorist uh, infusions in, in Latin America. It's a different kind of violence, and it is pervasive. And it actually has very deep roots all the way back to the wars of independence, which were very brutal in Latin America. And they were prosecuted over very, very difficult terrain, unlike the revolution here in this country, which was really held over the rolling hills of Virginia and Maryland. It was a very different war. It wiped out so much of the population in Latin America, and it never really left us. Let's switch gears to uh, something you're doing now, and that has to do with uh, your role in curating a new exhibit that opens tomorrow at the American Writers Museum called My America, Immigrant and Refugee Writers Today. Tell us about this exhibit. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, this is, I'm very passionate about this. The American Writers Museum is uh, just a few years old. It's celebrating its anniversary. It is an extraordinary place that doesn't exist anywhere else in this country, and it's a tribute to writers, uh, whether they were uh, born here, immigrated here, and this particular exhibit that is opening tomorrow is about that tremendous infusion of Asian American, Arab American, uh, Hispanic American, all kinds of Americans who have actually had uh, recent roots elsewhere and their tremendous uh, contributions to literature in this country. Uh, what, is, uh, what context would you put this exhibition and also your book, given the, the current uh, animus towards immigrants in many parts of American society? 
I hope that my book actually explains who we are as Hispanics, this tremendous, first of all, the presence that was here long before the pilgrims ever arrived, uh, in, in, in particularly in the uh, southwest of this, of this country, all the way up to Colorado. But, uh, but also, it, it explains that, that history, but it also explains the reason why history has created the tremendous influx of Hispanics in this country. We are now beyond 20% of the population in this country. We will soon be in 2050, 30%. One of every three Americans will have some measure of Latin American legacies and heritage. Murray Arana, thank you so much for stopping by. We very much appreciate it. Thank you very much, Phil. And once again, the book is called Silver, Sword, and Stone, Three Crucibles in the Latin American Story. You can read an excerpt on our website. And as we mentioned, a new exhibit curated in part by Arana called My American Immigrant and Refugee Writers Today opens tomorrow at the American Writers Museum. An artist with a cult following in Japan and Europe has his first show in the United States, and it is in Chicago. We visited for a strong dose of surrealism and satire. Dark moods loom in paintings that have been called both uneasy and alluring. Humans merge with technology, their environments, and the natural world. The works are by the contemporary Japanese artist and designer Tetsuya Ishida, who died at a young age in 2005. Inspired by Japanese comics and social realism, he made pictures of isolation. He's also reflecting the highly corporatized economy in which he lives. So it's very um, regimented, uh, people are really devoted to the corporations they work for and that there is really no individualization and he's feeling this incredible alienation from that uh, and a feeling of melancholy and a feeling of isolation and anxiety. Part of how he reflects this notion of man being consumed by this dehumanizing condition is to meld the human body with the machine. So for instance, in this painting, he is showing the man as microscope. And you will see throughout all of his paintings that he uses his own image and he replicates his face over and over and over again. And he did not mean it to be a self-portrait. It really was to become sort of every man. So he was really trying to reflect a condition that he felt everyone felt. I also like to point out that there is a lot of humor in his work. He understood that there was a sadness and that he was conveying this anxiety and alienation, but he also felt the nonsense of what he was doing and he wanted to convey the kind of black humor of the condition. The exhibition comes from Spain's National Museum of 20th Century Art in Madrid. It now occupies two floors at Wrightwood 659, the Lincoln Park Gallery space designed by Japanese architect Tada Ando. The show features nearly half of the paintings the artist made in his tragically brief lifetime. Tetsuya Ishida was killed at a train crossing in Tokyo in 2005 at the age of 32. Friends and family had been concerned about his mental health. His paintings are very layered in that some of the things are very obvious and yet there's still this lingering sense of not being able to quite touch him in a way. And so that alienation that he is painting actually really comes through. It's extraordinary work and it feels absolutely relevant today. The exhibition is called Self-Portrait of Other. It is at Wrightwood 659 through December 14th, and there's more imagery and information on our website. Among the many things we take for granted in our high-tech era is being able to immediately see what we type on a computer or phone. But that wasn't the case for early users of, pre -com of a pre-computer device known as, wait for it, the typewriter, that is, until a landmark invention by a Chicago-based company changed everything. Jeffrey Bear is here to tell us more in this week's edition of Ask Jeffrey. 
Hey, Jeffrey, I love stories like this. Great. Uh, Look, I've got a prop right oh, here. Oh, I can't wait for you to use it. <laughs> <laughs> and it stems from a question sent to us from Chicago. I'm curious to know more about the building on Randolph and Dearborn. It has a beautiful typewriter uh, motifs on the facade of the building. Uh, yes, right. So the building is, in fact, the um, old Oliver typewriter building, once the headquarters of the first uh, company to manufacture what was called a visible typewriter. So before Oliver came along in the 1890s, um, typewriters were blind um, so that you actually had to stop typing and turn a lever to see what you had typed which in my case would be a lot of mistakes. Um, the Oliver Building, shown here, uh, was completed in 1907. Um, it's notable in its own right. The famous architects Hollibert and Roche designed it. One thing that stands out um, is the elaborate ornamentation on the facade. Um, as our question asker mentioned, some of the uh, reliefs and carvings uh, point to what was going on inside. There it is. Mm. Notice the typewriter oh there uh, in the facade. And you also find things like eagles and rams and other elements uh, throughout. The it facility. sounds like the company revolutionized typewriter technology in its day. It, it did, and as I mentioned, we've got one right here on the set with us. And that's the same model that I saw on the facade. It, it, exactly. It's got the sort of like wing These, these sort of wing things on the side, right. Um, um, so the, this was loaned to us. Yeah, there, see the wings there on the side? This was loaned to us by the uh, Made in Chicago Museum and the Rogers West Park, I, I'm sorry, the, the Rogers Park West Ridge Historical Society, where this, this machine um, usually resides. Um, and uh, you'll notice that, as you, as you pointed out, it's a bit different from the typewriters. People like old timers like you and me uh, <laughs> would remember. Um, the company was founded actually by a minister named Thomas Oliver, who was frustrated by those blind typewriters, uh, which, as I said, um, struck the ribbon from underneath the papers. He couldn't see what you were typing. Oliver invented a U shaped bar shown here, uh, which acted as a down strike onto the typewriter ribbon, and this allowed typists to amazingly see what they were typing in real time time, the design proved to be incredibly popular, and in 1896, the company opened a large factory in Woodstock, Illinois. So let's take another look at our Oliver number no. 9. Um, this model uh, dates from 1917. The first thing, as we've already talked about, you'll notice are these, these wings. Um, uh, that's more different, uh, that, that's different from the more familiar types of typewriters. And here's that U-shaped bar that, that uh -huh. strikes the paper. So if you look closer, though, you'll see that it, it has a pretty similar layout to ones that we have seen today with the standard Q W E R T Y. I think if you see that, it's called the QWERTY keyboard, and there's a tab key um, and a, a kind of a shift button. Um, there's a, a, a figures button that you use to um, uh, get things like periods and commas and symbols like that. You actually have to hit the shift key to, to get a period. And this one's still in working condition. It is. It is. We're going to use it here in a minute. Um, the number nine was Oliver's most popular model, uh, making up uh, about half of the company's total sales. And they were not cheap. Look at that. $100 before World War wow. I. That was expensive. Um, uh, but, you know, they were made up for about half of the, 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 the sales of the company. Um, the office operations were housed in the Oliver Building on North Dearborn. And in 1920, two floors were added. Again, the building was designed by this famous Chicago School of Architecture firm, Holliburd and Roche. And tell us more about what exactly the Chicago School of Architecture was. Right. We've touched on it in other episodes, but remind us. Yeah, so it's not a school. It's actually more like a style of architecture. Uh, famous architects like Daniel Burnham and Louis Sullivan created buildings in this style. One of the hallmarks of this is the steel frame construction, which allowed architects to shift the weight uh, of the building uh, off of the building's walls, um, allowing these buildings to have much larger windows and the sort of minimal grid-like walls. So this is a great comparison. Look right next door to the Oliver Building is the Delaware Building, which is from right after the, the Chicago Fire, and this is what buildings look like before and after the fire. And you can see how the windows in the Oliver Building on the left there are much, much larger because of the steel frame. Um, the typical Chicago School Building window came to be known actually as the Chicago Window with this large middle pane of glass and then two narrow sash windows on either side. Remember there was no ventilate, there was no air conditioning or, or good indoor lighting back then, so you needed these big windows, but you also needed to open them up and get air in the building. Um, you can find these buildings all over the loop, most of which are much taller than the Oliver Building and emphasize their height with these uninterrupted vertical lines in the gridded facade. This is a classic example here. It's um, another by Holliburton and, and Roche again. It's the Marquette Building at Dearborn and Adams. Notice how these windows actually have 
two large panes in the middle instead of one. So back to the Oliver building, who's in there now? Oh, so um, Oliver Typewriter went out of business um, way back in the mid-1920s, um, although the brand lived on for several decades under British ownership. The Oliver Building had a much longer life and in 1984 was designated a Chicago landmark. Um, today, most of what remains on it is, is really only on the surface of the building. In the late 90s, it was bought and gutted by the Oriental Theater, which is now the Nederlander Theater next door, and, and they just basically expanded their backstage into the building um, while keeping the facade and part of the steel frame. And so when you pass by it today, you'll notice Broadway and Chicago ads alongside the elegant ornamentation uh, left over from the Oliver Building. So are we going to get a demonstration? Yeah, let me, let me <laughs> give you a demonstration right now. Let's see. Uh, what is it, Phil? The, the quick, quick brown... brown you know, oh. it's it's interesting. <laughs> I probably haven't used a typewriter. Muscle memory. It, it, well, it's muscle memory, but I haven't used a typewriter in like 20 years. That was a lot of work, banging oh, yeah. away. Oh, right. And it's it's similar to a modern typewriter, but then there's these kind of little odd things, like you know, the carriage return isn't quite the same. So, um, what what a what an what a blast from the past. It is a blast from the past. Uh, it's not that much different, maybe, from the typewriters you and I learned <laughs> on. Yeah. Anyway, back in the olden days. Well, you handled that very skillfully, Mr. Barry. Thank you very much. And you can learn more about the Oliver Typewriter Company on our website. And while you're there, be sure to submit your own questions too. Jeffrey Bear. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Ask Jeffrey on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Benny's Beverage Depot. In 1948, Benny's Beverage Depot opened its first store down the street from Wrigley Field. And for over 70 years, Benny's mission has remained the same, helping you celebrate the best times of your life. And that's our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. A ban on all e-cigarette and vaping products. The American Medical Association is calling for one, but should that be allowed? and how Stiver's Coffee roasts their beans the old-fashioned way in Chicago's Pilsen neighborhood. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Phil Ponce, and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.